Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. So tonight, we're going to go ahead and do a few pro tips again, but we've also got some listener questions that have been sent out, and we're going to try to get to a few of those. Got some questions about goals, got some questions about exposure and how we how we expose, what different kinds of exposure we use, all those types of things. And then uh, I know Mark has some other questions from the Instagram page as well. Honestly, I, I was going to ask you before the podcast, but we had such a lively conversation. You, How many questions do you have lined up for tonight? I've got three. Okay. But I think that they're good questions, and I think that probably each of us will have a little bit different take on them because everybody's got their own style, right? Sure. So I think, uh, I think they're going to take us in different directions. So how about this? How about we start with goal setting and it's a a very general question ask about what kind of goals we have each time we go out so let's go ahead and let's get started with the the full-time pro mark raycroft what kind of goal setting do you do that's a great question, really, because I don't, it doesn't even, I don't even think about that going out anymore, but it's there. It's, it's under the surface because as a professional, it's, it's so important to create content, more and more content these days as well. So, but yeah, I don't think about it um, literally, but if I was to dissect it a bit, I go out just hoping to create a few quality images that really make the trip worthwhile. I mean, it's, it's the money in selling the imagery allows me to continue to do what I do and pursue the lifestyle that feeds my soul. And that gives me the energy to share these stories and excitement with family, friends, wild and exposed audience. And to continue to do that, of course it requires an income. So when going out on a trip, I let it unfold. I mean, you never know. It's wildlife photography. That's the thrill of it. That's the speed of it. That's the unpredictability of weather and the animals. One thing that I thrive on myself personally is is animal behavior. I just love immersing myself in their world and feeling and thinking the way they're thinking and helping, having that help me be in position potentially. Doesn't work all the time. And to create the kind of images or storytelling videos for vlogs that I hope to collect. And of course, again, it's wildlife photography. It doesn't happen the majority of the time. But hopefully on each trip, each day, things unfold. And on a longer trip, a traveling adventure trip, it's always a tremendous relief if it starts off well. And we can, I bank some images and some work that will have a high probability of selling in my mind. So the goals are that is to simply hopefully collect the images that have that kind of caliber to impact, whether it's people wanting prints or publications, purchasing it for a one-time license to, to collect those images. That's the goal setting I do. I mean, it's obvious, but I don't, I, I don't think about it until I'm kind of out there, but you have to, you have to go with the flow. It's wildlife photography. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was just going to say, there's that, you've got to go with the flow. You got to be able to ebb and flow with the weather, with wildlife activity, with movement, with behaviors that are going on at the time you're there. Right. So we try to plan those trips around those behavior times, like the rut, for instance. Um, but I think, you know, it also depends on why you're going. And some of these trips for you, some of these trips for Mike, and I know some of these trips for Jason as well, and myself, as well as myself, are, we're going for a specific reason. We want to capture the deer rut. We want to capture the elk rut. We want to capture the bears during breeding season in the spring. So we're going for that reason. But are we going for ourselves? 
Are we going on assignment? Are we going, you know, to document just travel wildlife photography? Because it's a totally different kind of shooting that you do if you're going to just document the travel wildlife photography than it is if you're going to shoot for a periodical or you're going out trying to get, you know, what my, my one goal is I want to have one portfolio image, at least from every trip and by portfolio image, I mean, it's fine art quality. So that's a goal that I just, you know, that's kind of a pressure that I put on myself and I try to find those opportunities, but otherwise your goal setting depends on why you're there. I mean, I know for, for Mike specifically being video oriented, you know, it's more of a, what kind of story do you have to tell kind of goal, isn't it? Yeah. And I also think, I mean, I can expand on that, but I think too, it depends on where you're at in your career, right? If you're just starting out, your goal might be getting a sharp picture. Your goal might be getting, if you got the sharp down, you might be saying, okay, now this time I'm going to work on composition. You know, it's like what we talked about in the last podcast. I don't want to have a background issue with a, a stick coming out of a bugling bull. You know, it's all those kinds of things or where you're coming from in your career is going to dictate those goals for the moment. So that's the bigger thing than anything. I think you just, you just be realistic with where you're at. Yeah. That speaks to the portfolio image too, because a portfolio image today to me is not what a portfolio image was 10, 12 years ago. That, you know, (laughs) <laughs> the level of quality has obviously improved over the years. And so it takes a little bit more to get that, get that portfolio shot. Jason, how about you? Uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. I think we've talked a little bit about goal setting in the past, but for me, I don't know that I set goals for each shoot that I go on, but I'm definitely more of a planner. I'm the kind of person that for the most part wants to know what's going on. And it could even be for at least the next six months, but even for the next year. I've probably been driving Mike to death, driving him crazy, bugging him to death about next year in Alaska and what's going on and what's the dates and when are we coming. And I think Mike's a little bit like, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. And I'm like, no, I would like to get some dates on the calendar and know what's going on. Right. So that's just a little bit how I am. It's part of my personality. But that I, I actually look at it from a more like, what's this year? What are my goals from a photography standpoint? And I try to set those goals accordingly. And like you said, Ron, everybody hit on it. You know, it's, it's first of all, it's enjoy it. Second of all, go with the flow. Third of all, I want to make sure I hit the key things, you know, the deer rut, elk rut. I try to make sure I got some time set aside for those things. And then I also try to leave some time open for spur of the moment, crazy, you know, overnight, go do something crazy quick because something come up. Um, try to have some time for those kind of things as well. And then for me, I like to try to set some goals related to maybe maybe I'm working with on, I want to get published by a certain magazine or something like that. So trying to progress in my, from that side of things too. Um, maybe it's, I need to contact X amount of editors or I need to, you know, find out who the editors are for certain things and, and reach out to them or whatever it might be. Right. But I think it's important to have goals and to be, because if you don't have goals, you don't have an idea of where you're headed. You know, are you just spinning your wheels? Are you making progress? And I think it's super, super important. I found out in my my professional career that that's a very key part of um, having some success. And so I've tried to relate that not only to my personal life, but to my photography adventures and everything else. So, yeah, I don't, well, I don't think there's an answer. I think it's just, I think what you can hear from all four of us is that it's, It's not only individualized to each of us, but it's also individualized to what, you know, the reason is for your trip, like we talked about, and, you know, what your objectives are. Mark, you had something else. Well, I just wanted to elaborate because when I do, what I said earlier was about my photographic goals on a trip. But nowadays, after doing this this many years, not all of my destinations involve other people. But when it does, I'm often with a great group of friends like you guys. And that's a big part of the equation for me is having that time with people that I really care about and have fun with, and it just makes a great trip. So honestly, that's about half of it for me now. When I go to destinations that I share with other people, it's just that camaraderie and that friendship that's developed over years and meeting new people as well. So that's part of it. And then if we're going to extrapolate it even further about goals, I mean, the media world is changing every few months. And 
so are the opportunities to sell images as a professional. Some markets are being um, are hurt right now and are being constrained. Other ones are opening up. And so it's a matter of being progressive and, and as a professional, what are the markets that are opening up? What can we do, you know, on social media platforms? What's what's important to branch out? What types of media? Is it still photography? Is it creating blogs on YouTube? Is it creating different stories for social media? How can those things help one's objectives and goals? And so I have that as well, where I'm always trying to expand marketing opportunities as the technology changes because if we don't stay abreast of that we clearly miss opportunities too so that's taking the question further i know than just a, on the trip but um, all those things factor in it's it's a fun challenge in this profession right now because it's so dynamic the equipment is is so good as so many of you are experiencing and i'm seeing on your social media platforms as well but so it yeah, another goal I have is staying relevant in the newest technology and trying to capitalize to benefit and continue to pursue what I do as a profession and keep it viable. Because we all know, I mean, the stock market, stock photography market, sorry, the stock market's a whole other conversation. <laughs> and that's the other podcast. No, the, the stock <laughs> photography market is becomes more and more of a challenge with each passing year right now at least it's, it's been that way for many years so what else is going on out there what are the opportunities and i'm seeing more things changing and as with any profession you know we collect income from various sources you know whether it's print matter whether it's online sales whether it's international sales whether it's local publications you name it they all make up these different wedges to the pie and it's a matter of as a to me as a, wanting to be a smart business person is to have income coming from various sources so that it's not all risked all the efforts put into one type of market and these keep changing the opportunities and what's in the pie these different wedges so it's, again that's just a mental graphic i have that helps me try and figure out and think well what can we do next you know do we need an app do we need there are things happening and developing that you know websites are still relevant but you guys have all talked about before you know they're not as nearly as effective at having people discover us as they were five or ten years ago it's all social media now right so those are all goals that I have is just staying relevant and and try to be ahead of the curve or at least recognizing things that are happening. And there's so many young people that are embracing this technology and kicking butt out there. The their photos are fantastic and the way they're getting it out there, you know, it's it's fun to see more and more people. So sorry. That was a bit long winded, but the goal thing is just all over the place for me because there's different ways to look at it. But on exactly. a trip I on a trip nowadays, it's it's the fingers crossed to get great images that will have good market potential while also having fun with friends. Or if it's a solo trip, you know, doing what um, Greg Piper said a few podcasts ago is at times just enjoying the place that we're at. The light, you know, the sun setting is getting a little too dark or something or it's too harsh or the animals have gone embedded just to put the camera down, sit down. And the goal of mine is to feel just the gratitude of being there, too. I think you both touched on something too. It doesn't always have to be a trip or a or deal with actual clicking of a shutter, right? Because Jason was saying maybe I want to connect connect with more editors. <clears throat> a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll watch a lot of these wildlife programs because I'm always looking for ways that everybody tells a story. And if you can pick up a way that somebody shot something in a certain way you know, that can become your goal for the next shoot. Oh, well, they did this transition and they told this story and they used this wide shot and this tight shot and it worked really well. I'm going to try that next time. So you can watch stuff and then dream up these goals so that when you're in a si similar situation or if there's, you know, if you could try to emulate that, that would be a great goal to have. I can't let Christy listen to that because that's my excuse for binge watching planet earth and, planet earth two and blue planet and <laughs> just because you do learn how to tell those stories and what what works what ties it together that kind of thing especially the you know as i get into video or try to get into video a little bit more there's a whole different skill set uh, we could spin a pro tip there is watch it twice 
watch it to enjoy it because you just can't help get immersed in those that quality of programming and then go back a couple of days later and watch it from an editorial creative point of view the audio the the, the cuts you know the different framings composition how they did that and if you guys go back and listen to the podcast that was shane moore he said watch it with the audio off mm. yeah that's and cool too. pay attention right. to the shots don't listen to anything and just it forces you to look at the shots and you just see, oh, well, that worked and that worked. And they did this probably because of this. And yeah. So, I mean, Great there's tip. a bunch of good things. But yeah, it is a good pro tip. So, so that was a freebie. Yeah, it was a freebie. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't these all freebies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah, now. Technically, yes. Real quick, that Ron mentioned something and I, it's just been sit there and spin into my head and i think it we all kind of just glossed over it because i think we all realize that it's a reality but i think i know for myself early on in my adventures i used to think that i should be getting quite a few portfolio images when i go out and do a shoot and the reality is to say that you're going to get at least one image when you go do a shoot that's you know you can add to your portfolio a fine art type quality image that that's that is putting a lot of pressure on you, and it it is a not a, that's not a very easy thing to do. The more you learn, right? So I think it's that's a good that's just a good reminder to kind of keep yourself, you know, in re, in a reality check about what you can achieve. And it's not that you may go on a shoot and get more than one portfolio image. That's very possible too. But to go and not get a single one is very possible too. Mm-hmm. So just kind probably of keep that in mind, right? Yeah. More often than not, the more finicky you get. Yeah. And I, so many things have to come together. You, yep. you know, we talk about going out when the weather's bad. We talk about going when there's good behavior, you know, to be observed. And we talk about, you know, getting those locations where maybe these animals are a little bit more tolerant so you can have better opportunities at shots. But as somebody that is coming at this from a, a part-time perspective or, you know, w- we all have the good fortune of getting out a lot and there are a lot of our listeners that I've talked to that they've got a plan, you know, one or two trips a year and that's all they're going to get out. So they've got to, you know, they can't always just focus on the weather. They got to focus on what behaviors they want to photograph, what they want to observe, where they want to go, you know, because I might want this elk redding behavior, but I want it with, you know, the background of the Grand Tetons or the Canadian Rockies, some of these big grand vistas. And so they've got one or two shots a year. So the goal setting becomes a lot more critical. And, but again, can't talk about it enough. Don't put so much pressure on yourself that you miss it. Just enjoying where you're at and the environment that you're fortunate enough to be in. We all want the shots, but sometimes it's it's better to have the memories. That's what we take with us. That's a hope. fact. Yep. I have a question. From I'm just, the wild I have and these notes. Instagram, or is this just from you? I well, I I have some from the Instagram too, but with all these post-its I have around for today's podcast, the one glaring at me, I'll do first, and then I'll throw that off my laptop, and we'll find the next one. This is from me, <laughs> because you guys talked about it. Uh, on a recent podcast, I think it was either before or after recording. I think it was at the end, and and we'd just been a long time, and then we had to go because it was getting late. I think near the end of the last conversation, both Jason and Ron were talking about topaz. And I've used it limited. There's three or four images that I've had go out in the past six months that I've used topaz. Um, is it the denoise? Topaz yeah. denoise. Yep. And it seems like from conversations that we've had that you two have quite a bit of experience with that compared to me. And so I had a question. When I go into denoise and I have an image that I want to correct a little bit, just what your go-to settings are. Like I have experimented around. I use the sliders. I hit auto, then work backwards. Do you guys have settings that have worked for you that you kind of start with each time? Just for those that are playing with Topaz denoise when necessary. Again, I think with modern cameras, and and I, Jason, you mentioned this with large metal prints and stuff too. Maybe you can get into that brief, briefly there too. But I don't think it's 
something we need to use often with the quality of cameras now, but there are times where it's helpful and makes an image marketable. So if I could throw that out at you guys, what you, what you start with and, and what you've learned about this program with your experience. Go ahead, Jason. You've used it more than me. The first thing to remember with any of these programs, and it's, is again, they're, they're not magic. They're not magic. The, the image has to be of really good quality to, to start with in order for you to be able to be successful. And that's one thing I've learned. I've had some pretty noisy images I've tried to work with, and, and I've never, I wasn't happy with the results. It softened everything. I mean, it definitely cleans up the noise, but it cleans up the detail of the critter in some cases, too, if you're trying to go too extreme. So that's one thing I would just caution up front. Um, but yeah, I, I don't do a lot of tweaking. When I bring an image in there, uh, a lot of times I don't even hit the auto function. I just, there's three, there's three or four sliders. And one of them is, and I'm kind of trying to do this from memory, so bear with me. But one of them is how much you're going to, the denoise itself, how much noise you're going to remove. And one of them is um, detail. And one of them is, what's the other one, Ron? The other one is uh, add sharpness. Sharpness, thank you. Yep. So you can actually sharpen in the tool. And the one thing I've learned is that the more you sharpen and the more detail you add, so does the noise kind of want to stick around, especially just around the features of like, let me use an elk, for example. When you start to sharpen it, it'll do a really good job with the majority of the background. But sometimes like right in, like, for example, on your caribou there, right between the nose and that the that front um uh, that front fan coming out, right, right in that in that section, you might still see some noise in there. And as the the more you kind of start to crank that slider to get rid of that, the more you start to have other issues kind of show up. So again, some, some you just got to have a a good image to begin with. But I don't do too much. I've noticed that the more you start messing with those sliders too much, the more it really starts to kind of destroy the integrity of the image. So most of mine have been I a lot of them. I don't even mess with the sliders. I throw it in there. It it's good, and I move on. Hold or, on, hold on. You throw it in there, and it's, it does something without hitting auto. Correct. Yep. So I wasn't aware of that. So when you when you drop the image in, it does something even before you hit auto. It, it, and the sliders. So, but the sliders do show an adjustment at that point, don't they? Yes, they do show some adjustment. Correct. Yes. Well, it's kind of like in Lightroom when you drop an image into Lightroom. Some of those sliders have a default. So like if you go, if you scroll down about two thirds of the way in the develop module, you're going to come to uh, sharpness settings. So you've got, you've got sharpness, masking, and then you've got, um, oh, let's see, noise, and then I believe color, which is color noise. And so those sliders are, if and I'm not, sorry, hang on, my picture is going to be gone for just a second. Because oh, no. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in the, I know, I know you miss seeing my face. When you go down into these sliders, there is, um, in the sharpening section, there's a mount and then radius. So you can adjust the radius of the pixels. And then there's a detail slider. This is Topaz still, not Lightroom, right? No, this is Lightroom. Oh, so okay. those come with a default setting. So they're set at about 25. So same thing, when you take it over into Denoise, there's a, a standard setting. It's going to adjust it a little bit. If you just hit the apply button, it's going to make an adjustment on your image, and it's going to get rid of some of that noise without you doing anything. Okay. Now, and, and when I said Jason's used it more than I, I meant he's used it longer than I. He's had more experience with the program. Um but I, I'm in full agreement, and I don't use denoise. There's two sections. When you use denoise, there's a, you can use the denoise AI, or you can use the AI clear, it's called. And I use the AI clear, and it's more automatic. And there's just three sections. The three sections that Jason talked about is the same thing in AI clear, but you just hit low, high, or low, medium, high on two of them, and then one is a regular slider to recover detail. And I never take that slider more than 20. It'll go all the way to 100. But I've noticed in a few, and actually a few of our listeners, and I'm not going to name any names because 
I don't want anybody to think I'm throwing them under the bus, but some people are using it. And when you overuse it, it does definitely more damage to your image than, than it aids, uh, because it starts to add that artifacting and kind of makes it look, you know, have that plasticky look just the same as in Lightroom or in Photoshop. If you maxed out the, uh, denoise or yeah i guess it would be the noise canceling feature in lightroom if you take it to the max it makes everything look almost like a painting mm -hmm. like brush strokes and that's the same thing that this ai feature will do because ai artificial intelligence it's based on you know algorithms that are that are based on it looking at several million images so it's guessing where the sharpness needs to be applied, where the noise cancellation needs to be applied. And so it's still, there's still errors there and it can definitely be overdone. So that I, that's a long way around your question and I'm not even sure we're still on it. We went so many different places, but no, it's a good caution. It's a good caution. It's just there's this software, these tools that keep coming out and emerging. And this one's been, you know, I think we first heard it with Shane McGuire. A Shane years McGuire. Ago. Yeah. And, and she loved it for applications in that podcast that we did with her. And as these evolve, they're tools that we can put to use when necessary. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me the seventy nine ninety nine I paid for Topaz Denoise should have been the Topaz AI Clear. That I are they? They no, not it's the same. So Denoise, there's a little. If you look at the top of the sliders, yes, there is Denoise, and then right next to it to the right is AI clear. Okay. And, and if you, you it's just a, it's just it. a toggle. Yeah. You, yeah. You're either working with one or the other. Got it. Okay. That's useful. Yeah. So I'll play around with it some more. I just wanted some insight because these new tools come out and, and in those rare situations where it can help an image that has so much going for it, but might just have be off a little bit uh, for our listeners that could recover it. I thought you guys could give a bit of, of headway that advice that way. But yeah, with, with Photoshop, with Lightroom, whenever you take, I do it for fun sometimes when right, just to somebody's see. looking over my shoulder and I slide it all the way. It's like, what just happened? I don't know why they let them go that far, but you can just, anyway, but in moderation for sure. So that, that's some good tips. So yeah, thank you. Um, I've even been using it and it actually works better if it's lower ISO and it works, the AI on it is very, very good. Um, but if you're going to print a large metal, for example, I just did one. Um, for a, a customer and I threw it in there and I was blown away by how well it worked and there's no doubt in my mind that thing is going to print just beautifully on a you know enlarged on a great big size metal um, and metal has a tendency to really show any flaws or any kind of little things you have going on in an image especially when you're going to blow it up you know six foot wide by four foot tall or something right so I love those big ones yeah they're very neat but you know you got to be you got to make sure your image is of really good quality if you're going to do that so anyways that's the only other thing i'd add you know is just to um don't be afraid to use it and the other thing i'll add and this is a sales pitch for topaz i know but i've had it for a year now and i think i've gotten three free updates with just the with just the denoise and all the other ones i've got the suite and I've gotten two or three updates for the other ones too. And I've noticed a significant difference in each update. They're not just phony, you know, quick, I'm doing updates to keep you happy. You think I'm working on this. I've noticed performance enhancements and they've gotten that much better in just a year's time. So they're definitely a company that believes in, you know, ab absolutely improving the product and trying to bring the best value to the customer for sure. So fun stuff. And they are not a sponsor of the Wild and Exposed podcast. <laughs> they should no, be. they're not. They should be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as much as we talk about years. them. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump in. We've had a couple questions. We'll move into a couple more questions in a minute. But let's jump into pro tips for the, the first round of pro tips. Mike, you have been kind of quiet, and now you're nodding your head. So I think you got something right on the tip of your tongue. Jump in and have at it got so many and the last show we did i was That's talking right. about so cold weather part of this uh pre-conversation was mike was offering he had so many pro tips he was offering to sell them to us if Eyes we bitter. if we didn't have any gotta make my money somewhere mark <laughs> said you have to have multiple streams of income that was one of my streams <laughs> 
so I'm going to go back to this cold weather thing. It's winter. Everybody's getting ready to get out there and you got to be comfortable, right? So last, last week we talked about hand warmers. I love them. It's great to keep your hands going when it's super cold outside. This week, so I was out, spent a lot of time in Alaska, late fall, it gets pretty cold. You start out in August and you're sweating, you know, you're hiking, you're sweating. You just can't imagine in a couple of weeks it's going to be that cold. Within a couple of weeks, I'm wearing long underwear, but it's cold in the morning and then it warms up midday. And then if you're out hiking around, then you just, you're wearing too much. How many times have you guys had that issue where you're wearing these long underwear and you're like, I got to take these things off because I'm just killing myself. I'm, you know, hiking five, six, seven, eight miles and it's just sweaty and uncomfortable. But it's a major deal. You got to find a place. You got to take your pants off, take your shoes off, everything in the woods, get it all figured out. These new long underwear that I've been using, they zip off. The legs have zippers on the side, right? So you don't have to take your boots off. You just undo your trousers, let them fall down to your ankles, and you zip, zip, and off come off the long underwear, and you put your pants back up, and you're ready to go. It takes like a minute, right? Otherwise, you're sitting there for 10 minutes undressing and redressing. And it's just uh, every time I wear those things, I'm like, this is the bomb. You know, I'll be out shooting with somebody. I'm like, I got to go take off my long underwear. I'll be back. And they expect me to be gone for five or 10 minutes. And I come back in a minute after jumping behind a tree. And they're like, what? Are you sure you were wearing any? But there's a couple of places that. Um, none ya. None of your business. <laughs> none of your business. Uh, I'll put links in the show notes, but there's first light makes them. And then there's a company called Kuyu that makes them and they make them in different weights. So you can have super thick ones. You can have super thin ones. And I've just, uh, ended up getting three or four different ones for different temperatures. And, and then it's super easy to put them back on too, right? Same thing. You just don't have to undress in the field. You can just quickly get them off and on. So I thought that would be an awesome pro tip because unless you're familiar with those two companies, I don't know that you would be familiar with that product. Maybe there's some other people that make them, but I'm not aware of it, but it is the ticket. Michael Morrow put the exposed in wild and exposed right here <laughs> on tonight's pro tip podcast. I, I do. Have, I have Mark, two weights of those and love them. That's yeah. just it. When we're, we're in Alaska and in mountain country, you've got the hiking boots that lace all the way up and do take five minutes to put on. Same thing. Yeah, I've, I've had them for four or five years anyway, and, and they're the go-to for sure. Yeah. And there's nothing to them. Throw them in your pack. Right. Put them back on later. They're, and they're merino wool. So, you know, they dry out quickly. They're breathable. Sure. Appreciate you guys waiting for a podcast to share this information. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it might sound funny, but it is effective. Because you don't want to be out there freezing your butt off first thing. You got to be warm, but then you don't want to be sweating in the middle of the day when you're trying to traipse around chasing the, what are, not chasing, but photographing whatever you're photographing. I don't know. It's the ticket. Yeah, the gear, it's it's important. Good gear makes a difference in so many ways on, on these trips, whether it's a day trip, multi-day trip. So yeah, great insights. Don't the visuals, eh, but the yeah, insights are yeah, good. Don't take the visuals <laughs> home with you. What do you mean? I was just going to say for the rest of you listeners who are having the same question about how does this really work? Check the show notes. Mike's got a video showing you exactly how they work. <laughs> <laughs> Great pair of boxers on. Yes. Great yeah. Pair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tiger stripe. we we'll get some. <laughs> <laughs> No, I will put a link in the show notes to them. I have a couple of things, and I'm not sure how well they'll hold up, but there are things Nothing's that... going to hold up to what I just did. Uh, well, no. No. No, that's... You could have saved need... that for last, probably. Yeah. That should have been the logo and everything. Absolutely. <laughs> um, something I've been doing... I'll throw this one out here first. As far as videos, more and more videos being filmed on different devices on our trips. Everybody's doing it. I see it all over social media and it's fantastic. It helps tell the story. We can do it so readily now compared to only a matter of years ago. It was such a complex process. Now I'm sorry. I apologize in advance in the sense that I use an iPhone and this is something that works on Apple. 
But I just was going to go through very quickly the workflow and how easy it is to take footage, whether it's from an action camera, whether it's from a DSLR, mirrorless camera, whatever you're using. What I do is I put it on my desktop and then I just airdrop it onto my iPhone for the purpose of social media is what I'm talking about here, not commercial applications that way, but to get it out there. I airdrop it onto my smartphone and the editing tools on the smartphone, I, I just love it. As I'm sure any of you that have played around with, it's so easy to clip your, your video, make it short enough so that it's effective on Instagram. And for a story, for an Instagram post, you know, I put up maybe a 15 second video. I don't make it long because people just don't watch it for long. So I take the best 15 seconds out of that video, of whatever might be happening and edit it on the phone. Super easy. You can do it right in the photo album. It just is this little yellow uh, slide bar and then you export it. You can export it as a new video file or the existing one. You can copy over it depending what you want to do in your in your video album or your photo album. Then I use, and we've talked about this before, um, the iWatermark app. Again, not a sponsor, but should be a sponsor of the podcast. Get the yellow one if you go this route. And I think it was $5. And then you can just create whatever kind of watermark you want and lay it on your video. For those of you that want to watermark, and as a professional, I do. And it's not just this, you know, big watermark arguably can have an impact on the success of a video on social media, but there should be enough of a watermark there that when somebody sees it, they know whose footage they're watching. To me, it doesn't make sense that if you've gone and captured this and created a great video and you put it up there and then it's, it's shared, it happens, right? Whether you permit it or not, but hopefully they ask first. If there's no identifier on there, then anybody who sees it doesn't know where it came from unless they um, connect to your feed, which they don't always do either. So having the watermark keeps that possible. So if somebody sees it and is interested in what you're doing, they can find you because your name's there, your your Instagram feed's there. So I watermark, the yellow one is the one that's video compatible. There's a blue one as well that's I think only a dollar and cheaper. That's for photos, but the yellow one does both. And really you can have quite a dynamic range of watermarks created there. So it's just a workflow that's made for me personally, instead of going into Premiere or some of the other programs that I really want to become good at, this has been so fast just to airdrop it to my phone, edit it to 15 seconds, watermark it, and post it. And then if it's a story, I love all the different things we can put on stories on social media, on Instagram, as far as activity interaction components, um, active emojis and stuff like that as well and then there's the instagram feed but i just wanted to highlight how it's that straightforward and of course if you film it on your on your smartphone you're off to the races anyway because it's right on your device but it's so easy to airdrop a 4k video that was shot on a dslr onto your smartphone and edit and within literally a minute or two you're ready to put it on social media it's a fun process i use it all the time i like it and you talking about the the difference between the blue and the yellow eye watermark apps um and again not a sponsor but it is a, a good tool especially for social media content like mark said but i have noticed that the blue not only does it just work for stills but it also what i've seen it kind of diminishes the uh the quality of the image a little bit so the image won't be as sharp after you watermark it with with the blue the yellow i haven't seen that at all um but the the blue definitely has an impact on the quality of the image before you post it so i would use that caution it's worth the extra four dollars to ensure that the quality of your images is maintained so yeah that's a that's good social media workflow that's something that we all do right the easier the better right fewer clicks mm -hmm. least amount of time there's so much going on with these platforms already that's time consuming so i just it's been kind of a relief it's a breath of fresh air to be able to take a video and within a couple minutes post it jason may be ready but i'm going to go next just because it kind of fits in with what you just talked about um and there's several different types of these but this is just a little 
flash drive. This one is made by SanDisk. I'm not even sure you can see that. But it is, it's a flash drive USB 3 on one side. But then the other side is a mini USB so that I can plug it into an iPhone and download images off of my phone and either tra or put them, get them downloaded from the computer and then onto the phone. It works both ways. But this is about, it was about $20. It's 128 gigabytes. So you can store a lot of images on here, but it also keeps the space freed up on your phone. And what I've noticed in trying to remember to get some uh, some content for each trip or trying to get some story material, you know, when you're out and, and filming with your phone is that I do so much of that that the space on my phone becomes a, a premium. So this is just a good tool and it, it just goes in my camera bag zip it in the top zipper. I can get it whenever I need it, download some images or download some videos. And then it's, it's an easy transfer, but it's also an extra 128 gigabytes of memory on my phone basically is what it turns out to be. And it's just a little tiny piece of, of gear that you might not use every day, but when you need it, it is there. Good backup. Yeah, it is a good backup for a phone. True. All right, Jason, sorry I cut you off on that one, but Mark was talking about social media, so I thought I'd just throw that one out. Okay, I get it. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> My first pro tip is just, it's an easy one, and it's right in line with what you were just talking about, Ron. When you're buying cards for your camera, don't skimp on quality. It, I, I, I think it's one of the places that a lot of people tend to skip on quality, and I know quite a few people that it's bit them in the butt. And if you spend a little more money on that, if you think about it, that's what you're out there for. Um, and those images are very, you know, <laughs> they're worth a lot to, to each of us. Not only for maybe potentially from a sales standpoint, but also just for our personal memories. Uh, so don't skimp on the, the cost of cards. Use high quality cards. doesn't matter what kind of card you're using. If it's an SD, if it's a new CF Express, whatever it is. Just get the higher quality stuff. And if you look online, you can find it pretty easily. Some of my favorites that I use are the Hoodmans or the um, the Blacks. And both of those cards are pretty much bulletproof. They're dustproof, waterproof. Um, and they have they carry a lifetime guarantee with them. And the beautiful thing about the lifetime guarantee is they also come with free data recovery and free no-question-asked replacement if you have any problems with them. So, yes, you spend more money on a card like that. But the peace of mind and knowing that if I have a problem that I can get free data recovery and get the card replaced with no questions. And I've actually had to use it uh, once before, um, even on a higher quality card, because, you know, stuff just breaks. But that's worth it's worth it to me, you know. So if you can you can skimp on some things, this is, in my opinion, something you don't want to skimp on. But Yeah, and I think in addition to the type of card, it's worth it to do a little research on the speed. You know, because you can have two CFast Express cards and the packaging, the size of the card, everything looks the exact same, but one writes a lot faster or reads a lot faster and that all makes a difference. I have a card, one of the brands you just mentioned that isn't working worth a hoot. Yeah. And I don't think it's the card, but I think I might have just got a bad card. I mean, that camera shuts off. It won't even record to it. So I called the guy I bought it from and just said, hey, this is not working. He's like, we have never had that problem. Just send it back and we'll, we'll, we will replace it. So, yeah, but pay attention to the speed in addition to the quality, you know, some of yeah. those bigger name brands are going to be, I don't think you can go wrong with them, but yeah, look at the, they're not all created equal. Yeah, I know that's a huge, that's a huge point because I've had that very issue happen where even on my Nikon D50, I bought a little slower card and wasn't, didn't pay attention, didn't realize it. And, the, the speed at which my camera can write to the card and also how long it takes before it buffers changes dramatically with the speed of the card. So you, if you want the best performance out of your camera, you're absolutely right, Mike. You got to you gotta make sure you're getting the latest and greatest as far as speed and that. And, of course, all that comes at a cost. But, again, it's going to give you the best performance out of your camera, the best peace of mind, 
and they'll they'll last the the longest too for for no doubt but it's just like spending two thousand dollars on a lens and putting a fifty dollar filter on it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah same thing sorry think think about the film days and you know we spend money on cards it's still a hundredth of what it film cost right? Get the right cards for the speed. It's times are so good for photographers. If you're shooting a Nikon, the XQD cards are superior to the SD as far as buffering and speed. And I, that's always my go-to in, in cameras that have the Nikons that had the XQD slot, but I have the SD in as, as an overflow. But a question I have, and this isn't something I do when you think about it, I haven't knock on wood, I haven't had a card quit on me. But you're right, if you're on a trip and you have a 128 gig card and you're having an amazing day and you're writing everything to one card and it did quit, do you guys with cameras with two card slots have the backup recording? Or mine's always set just for overflow because I haven't ever been burned. Yeah. That way. No, because it, it it chews up your buffer so much faster if you're if you're writing twice. I mean, if you're a wedding photographer, you can do that because you're taking, what, one image every 10, 15 seconds, maybe, or you might have a real short burst, but you're a wildlife photographer and you've got something crazy going on in front of you. You're burning through it. You know, those, the elk, all of a sudden they're parallel walking and then they start turning to face each other. You know, it's about to be on and it's going to be blazing for a minute or two and then it's going to be over. You can't necessarily take the chance on right into two cards, burn up all your memory, number one, but also hit that buffer when it's 10 seconds into a two minute elk fight. Good tip. There's a, there's a right at a left field. We should, we should get somebody from a card company on too, because you hear about a million little things, right? There's, I've heard people say that cards wear out. I've never had one wear out, but I'm changing camera systems enough that I always am buying new cards. But if, if you do get that killer shot and it's one of the, it happened to be the last time that cards working. I mean, Jason, you just said you recovered some stuff, right? But is there a time when you can't, it's like exposing a roll of film. You're never going to get it back. So I don't know. I would like to talk to somebody that actually knows that technology and could speak to, yeah, they do wear out. No, they won't wear out. Um, you know, think about dropping, I've dropped them before and then you just put them in and you go and you don't think about it. But is that, does that provide wear and tear that just, one of the things that I was going to say is when you start to see corrupted images, so you bring them all into Lightroom and there's pixels that are burn out or they kind of look like the old UHS TV, you know, when you, <laughs> when you had part of the TV picture that wasn't coming through, when you start to see that, get rid of the card because it is it is degrading to the point where you're going to start losing images and it's not just a formatting issue it's a the card is going bad and i've had a i've had it happen a few times and it's not every image it'll be when you're shooting that burst and then all of a sudden there's one that's got this big pink spot in the middle of your your image that should be fall color it's time to get rid of that card and move on I think it'd be awesome to have somebody on and I, and, and that's a good point. Just a real quick thing. If you're looking on Amazon to buy a card or something, you see a 128 gig card. One's cheaper than the other one. There's a reason. <laughs> Pay attention to those details. Don't just buy the cheaper card because You think it's a better deal. There's a reason it's cheaper. That's the thing. That's at the, at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, but buy the more expensive one because that's going to be the one that's going to give you the best performance more than likely. So. All that to say, yes, we should have somebody on that knows what the hell they're talking about. Well, it'd be good if somebody in that profession, they could say, you know what? You really should be changing your cards every so often if, if you're that active yeah, photographer. True. Just for the security and for the expense. You know, again, film, I'm not going to say what it costs, but it was a lot back in the day. That was the big thing about the profession. But these cards, I mean, and same with external hard drives. I mean, there's some cost to them, but it's peanuts compared to what Fuji Velvia cost. I mean, it was worth it. And that was the go-to for years and years, but really there's nothing to complain about now to stay, to stay up to speed. I've got a couple of video questions, actually. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. No Netflix now. <laughs> Later, Ron. All right, 
my question is, when is Ron going to take me to go uh, photograph bobcats in Wyoming? <laughs> okay, that was not a good question. <laughs> Did you hear it? That's my question. We all have that question. <laughs> uh, that one was from Tanner Perks. Uh, Tanner, we were on a trip in Grand Teton National Park, and that was the question that he had. When are we going to go shoot bobcats? I will say that the next time I have that kind of an opportunity, there's a whole bunch of people that want to come up. I have no idea when it'll be. <laughs> they don't come back to the same spot every year. So it's a little bit more. Well, I should say when they're, when they're in a spot as busy as that railroad intersection that I had before that railroad trestle bridge that I had before, they don't come back to a situation like that because it's, it's far too busy. There's a County road that went right by it. There was not a lot of traffic, but there was a substantial amount of traffic and that's not somewhere they're going to come back to. If you find an isolated den, then uh, yeah, they will return to that. And I think, you know, if you look at, Moose Man's images, Rick and Libby have gotten a couple years worth of images of some bobcats out on the East Coast and just had unbelievable opportunities for not only stills, but for video as well. Um, so there, there are circumstances where, you know, we can do that, but bobcats are a lot like lynx in that the the population increases and decreases based on prey base and so we have a couple main prey bases here number one is prairie dogs and the second is rabbits and hares which are you know the jackrabbits the larger hares so as those populations increase and decrease so do the population of bobcat so i'd love to get you out here to photograph bobcats tanner and many others but we're just going to have to wait for the right opportunity. I have another question that ties into into your neck of the woods, Ron, from a California listener on, on Instagram asked for tips on finding sage gross lex. The tip is hire me and I will take you. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good tip. Um, Enough said. Well, <laughs> yeah, there is that. You you can do some things to do some research on your own. However, I will say that, you know, what it, the big suggestion that I would make is that you contact a biologist in the area that you want to go photograph in. But I will tell you that the biologists are tighter and tighter and tighter with that information every year because the population continues to decrease. Any additional pressure on the grouse you know, can be a contributing factor to that decrease. So some of them won't give you, won't give that information out anymore. Some of them don't post that information anymore um, with the biological data. And it, it just depends, you know, species to species. If you look in Wyoming, you can see every documented fisher sighting in the state of Wyoming. And you can look for the clusters and you can go spend time in those areas. With sage grouse, are, like I said, they're a little bit tighter with that information. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons why some of them are good. Some of them are really, really bad. Um, people go looking for them just to get rid of them because they think it's going to impact them fiscally. But so, they're an endangered species, correct? Well, they they did not get listed. They didn't? No. Oh, but, I thought I'd heard that. Okay. No, that was that was kind of what it looked like was going to happen. And then they did not list them. Um, they have continued, though, to be very conservative with the management of, of sage grouse. And in some areas, big portions of the state, there's no longer any sage grouse hunting. Um, in some portions of the state, it went from a one-month season to a six-day season. And those are the areas where there's a lot of birds. So they're being very conservative with the sage grouse but they're also very conservative with the information on where to photograph that being said there are you know in in every region there's some leks that are right along public roadways that they do suggest that you 
you know, use those to, to go observe and to photograph. And that information is readily available. And if I don't know who did you, I don't know who sent it, but they can feel free to, to contact me on Instagram and yeah, I can a, kind of direct message on Instagram, point them in the right direction. Uh, because it, it, it's something everybody should see once it's, it's crazy that a bird that looks so almost dull and unassuming outside of that, you know, six week season can just take on this alien like appearance and kind of just dominate the, the landscape in those small areas where they're at, where they gather. It's a, it's a pretty neat spectacle. They're incredible. They're straight out of star Wars, man. All I need is their little <laughs> lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to do a question? Okay. Here's a question yeah, that question. also came in through our Instagram DM or direct message. Hit us up that way with questions or comments anytime. This was a first timer to Yellowstone. So for those of you experienced there, this photographer wanted to know tips on how to save money there, ask questions about the accessibility of camping and just what to kind of strategize for the first time going there, what you, what you guys are willing to hand out as far as ideas that way. For saving money, camping in areas of the park that are outside of campgrounds is illegal in Yellowstone technically. So I would say focus on finding areas in the national forest just outside of the park. Um, there, all four sides of the park, you can find national forest spots where you can camp and you're still very close to being where you want to be for each morning. So I would say if, if your goal is to save money, go on the cheap car camp, what it, you know, Mark, I think you call it glamping, right? The glamping. car camping and a van yeah. or a truck in, in the back. Well, it's eight foot. You can, it's six anyway, right. stretch out, Spread out. Got the right setup. There's lots of photographers I've seen on Instagram in, in the United States and Canada creating great rigs in their in their trucks or vans oh, for, sure. for travel that, you know, they build it up and put boxes underneath. You got your rubber maids with your gear. Anyway, I'm, that's a whole other yeah. thing. Yeah. That's definitely the best way to do it on the cheap. You know, you can ask the, uh, the park service. Some of them are more forthcoming with information than others. As far as sending you in the right direction, some of them just tell you there's wildlife everywhere in the park, so have at it and don't give you any information at all. But don't be afraid to reach out to people either. Photographers that you see that photograph a lot in, in that area, again, some you'll find don't want to give you any information at all, but some of them will, you know, at least put you in the right area, the right spot. And again, the animals are wild. So we, while we can tell you the general location where to be, it's not going to pinpoint anything for sure because they're moving all the time. You have anything to add, Jason? Um, yeah, just one, just one thing. Um, the first thing that came to my mind when that question was asked was, what do you, what time of year do you want to go? What are you hoping to photograph? Because every season brings something different to photograph and, I think that's the first question you have to ask. And then the difficulties or ease of doing that become, you know, uh, more apparent and more different. Like, for example, if you want to go to do winter stuff in out of Gardner um, in the middle of the winter in January, February, it's a little chilly to do some car camping, right? But you can still do it on the cheap. There's still options available. Um, or if you want to do it in the summer, spring or fall, it's a little easier to car camp. But um, yeah, just so just ask that question first, right? Back to goals. What's your goal? Um, am I going to try to go photograph the okra? Am I going to go try to get bears in the spring? Um, what am I trying to get? Am I want to get frosty bison in the winter? You know, all of that brings its own set of challenges and, and a different way of maybe approaching it. So, well, it never hurts to ask questions, right? You will find people that are willing to share, especially in person that way. Some won't, but some will. And worst case is they say, no, they're not going to share. But those that do, you can gain a lot of insight, especially on somebody's first trip to a new new location to photograph. And that actually leads me into one of my pro tips if we want to go there. I always take with me, and we talked about this in the camping episode on how to car camp a little bit. But not just for car camping. I always have with me in my um, my 
adventure photography kit, if you will, um, a jet boil or an MSR reactor, one of those um, little devices that can heat up water. Um, and that's another way to save money. You want to do this on the cheap is bring your own food, like Ron alluded to. Um, but you also, to get the most out of your day, you know, just bring some uh, freeze-dried stuff. Um, there's lots of different meals out there. You know, have your own coffee, your hot chocolate, your cider, whatever you prefer. But it's just nice to have one of those. Even when I'm in a hotel, I bring my own uh, jet boiler MSR reactor with me um, so I can have that as an option too. And that helps save some money. Um, and it's come in handy for a lot of different reasons. And, and I'll just give you one quick. In the fall, when it gets really cold, when you're truck camping, you can actually, you've, we've talked, you've heard about heating up rocks over a fire to, right? You can actually warm up water in your jet boil and put it in your, um, your, uh, your cup, your, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, the name's Your Nalgene mind. bottle. Your Nalgene, thank you. You can put it in your Nalgene, right? And you can slip it down there in your sleeping bag. And that'll provide quite a bit of warmth for quite a while, believe it or not. Keep your toes nice and warm. So, Great tip. There is a rumor, though, that something bad happens when you put your hand on warm water while you're sleeping. <laughs> We're going back there. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so you have to be days. careful with that. Do not let your fingers go into warm water while you're sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah I, I i love the jet boil and and that kind of product and we for adventure algonquin for the interior stuff we do and i just we use that all the time more it's just so fast morning coffee whatever the break well not breakfast you don't need to heat up water for that but any of those free dress free oatmeal dry oatmeal yeah and, you know it's the first time i've heard of this nalgene thing trick that's fantastic you know, if you're camping and you're freezing, it's a cold night. Five, ten minutes later, you're set. Through. Yeah. Remember That's really those days in Denali yeah. when we used to have to, we get those photo permits and we would have to have a hard-sided camper. Or that the, that's the only way they would let you into the park, right? Such wonderful memories. <clears throat> yeah. Well, when you had a hard-sided camper, you basically had a stove in there if you rented a camper in Anchorage. What I used to do before I went to bed at night, I would make all my coffee, get it ready, get the water in the pan, and then my alarm would go off, and I'd just lean over the bed and turn on that that burner just to heat up the water, and that provides enough heat even just to heat up the inside of the camper. So not only can you heat the inside of your sleeping bag, but just that little bit of heat circulating, if you're in the back of a truck with a camper shell, it's actually going to give you enough heat to make it, if it's super cold outside, it's going to make it comfortable enough to put your zip off underwear on. <laughs> do you do that though? Do you use it inside the camper? I mean, I'm always in a tent with, with the jet boy. I stuff. would worry I mean, about it with a tent, you know, just cause they're so flammable, but in a well, camper, no, I'm outside. I mean, I don't sleep in, I don't use it in the tent. I use it outside. No, this That's was in a hard point. sided camper. So, I mean, it was a, so stove it's a built in with, stove. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it All would right. heat it up. But if, if you're sleeping in the back of the truck, like Jason does a lot and you have a, a platform for your bed. I mean, there would be a solid place that you could be very safe with, you know, turning on a jet boil and it would give enough heat guaranteed. It would give you enough heat to make it way more yep. comfortable than when it's super chilly outside. Question. Here's a 16 year old question, even though I'm, I'm just a little bit older than 16. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> my, my paranoia with that, my, my concern would be with the gas fumes. If there's anything like that, if you have an open flame in the back, in the back of the, truck on the even even with like a cap on it is is that safe i mean for me i'm out 20 yards away doing it and i bring it back in that's just i don't know well it's i don't question. think you want to fall back asleep and let it just burn 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 but i would crack the you know on a camper show there's little windows that you can crack open and if you just get enough little fresh air circulating it's i don't, you don't think have to worry about the fuel problem. no the gas tank and fumes okay no All if right. you're using a jet boil or a i mean the truck stove, gas the vehicle gas Oh, no, is any fume? No, it's sealed enough. Okay, see, it's just I just uh, that's yeah. real. It's a good question. It really is because, I mean, you don't you like Mike said you don't want to like roll over, turn it on, and then snuggle back in your bag with all the windows shut and fall asleep until the tank runs out. That no. might be a problem, but you know yeah. if you're yeah, you, you don't want to you don't want to use it to heat the camper, but it's a positive <laughs> byproduct of heating the water. Right, got it. Right, yeah. <laughs> so pay attention to what's happening. <laughs> Run it, heat the water. Takes okay. the edge off, right? right. Yeah, I've always been that way too with just like seeing the 
the people who have their barbecue on their tailgate. I'm like, ah, that's a little close for me. You know, I just, I know three feet away is just, you know. Maybe that's so just that you of... Canadians are way too safe. <laughs> well, there's a big, there's a we lot do. of terrain out here. I can move that barbecue 10 yards away from the tailgate and I feel a lot better about barbecue. We just have somebody hold our beer and we go for it. I will stop with the hold my beer bit. No, I, we have, you know. It's about to get Western. <laughs> what about silhouettes, guys? I love silhouettes. Ooh, now, it's, they're not necessarily a big seller, but they're a great addition to a portfolio or for a species to create a photo essay to have those early morning, pre-dawn, the sky, if it's got any attitude, Go out and get silhouettes. So much fun because then if, when the sun comes up, you switch around and it's game on for the traditional style of imagery. It's like two experiences within an hour. But something I learned years ago from another friend, photographer, I'm in the field. One of the first times I was trying silhouettes and trusting the camera to nail it, uh, 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 it's not going to happen. You have to seriously underexpose if you want that attitude in the sky and that vibrant dark red. And who cares if the animal that you're silhouetting, it's skylined, right? Goes black, black, black in exchange for that vibrant sky that's happening. So when doing silhouettes, underexpose one, two, sometimes even maybe three stops Check it on the back of your camera. I'm checking the back of my camera constantly when I'm playing with silhouettes because I'm still not mirrorless and I still don't, can't just, what you see is what you get. WYSIWYG. No. What's that? WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG, yes. What you see is what you get. I'm not WYSIWYG yet <laughs> with the DSLR, but that way you can see as far as the intensity of what you're balancing between the sky and the subject that you're silhouetting by looking at it and, and continuing to adjust and do the plus minus and bracket that way and have fun with it, but underexposed, go underexposed for that, for that, uh, graphic or sorry, saturated moody sky. So, uh, this is a little shameless plug, but I had a place in Rocky mountain national park where I could get silhouettes, like if we knew we were going to have a really nice sunrise, I would go to the spot because it wasn't a hundred percent, but 60, 70% of the time you're going to find an elk up on top of these hills. And there was a straight shot out to the sunrise. <clears throat> so for years I shot that and then I would submit them to the state of Colorado for some wildlife stuff that they were doing out of the blue. One day I get a, a license plate in the mail and it's, these guys have used all my silhouettes on this. It's a hunting and conservation license plate that you can order as a special plate. But all those silhouettes are now on a, a plate. I see them daily all, everywhere in Colorado. And it's just, they were able to use those silhouettes as part of the license plate design. And it's, it's kind of a cool application. I mean, you can use it for all kinds of stuff like that, which headers on web pages. I mean, it works for all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, it's an awesome plate. I've seen it. People should have that if they're in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah, yes. support the wildlife. Michael and, and Michael Morrow. I wish they'd have put my big fat signature on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I make sure everybody knows that and the video of the bear standing the traffic cone back up. Oh, I'm like, right. I know that. I know the guy that did that. That one's making. I knew the again. guy that. I knew the guy that did that before somebody stripped his watermark off <laughs> of that video. I am making money on that now, though. Good. So I don't know. In, and we've talked about that. And for a long time, I didn't make nothing. But once I licensed it to one of those companies, the viral video companies, it's not a lot, but it's enough to keep you in jet boil oatmeal. That's that's all I care about, really. <laughs> <laughs> Mark and I are kind of on the same brainwave tonight because he was talking about silhouettes and my, what, what I was going to talk about is a couple of things that you can do before, before sunrise when you're out, because we're all out there before, right. Trying to, to find wildlife and look for opportunities and prepare for opportunities. There is a couple of things that you can do to make those usable timeframes. One would be the silhouettes. 
like Mark just covered, but the other would be pan blurs because you can, you can increase your ISO a little bit, you know, get up to about 3,200, decrease your shutter speed, get down to about one sixtieth of a second. Some people have steady enough hands. They can get a nice pan blur at about one thirtieth of a second. I'm not that guy. I need to have a little bit more shutter speed to be able to get the head sharp while the animal's moving. But just practice and to to get the pan blur, you're going to be properly exposed, but you're going to have a very slow shutter speed. So you've got to time the motion of the animal with the motion of the camera. So put your focus point right on the animal's head and then just time your movement, rotate at the hips, you know, good technique. You do. Take a lazy Susan with you into the woods. Yeah, you can, Mm -hmm. as long as you can spin it at the same rate as the movement of the animal. Yep, somebody to pull focus and somebody else to activate the remote shutter, right? And the lazy Susan. Or you can just rotate at the hips. But you've got, you've got to make sure you've got good shutter technique. And I think that this is something that we don't talk about enough, you know, is, is technique while you're shooting because it makes a ton of difference. If you're just hammering on that shutter with your forefinger, you're, it's going to be, you're going to have to have a pretty fast shutter speed to be able to get a sharp image, especially when you're at that, you know, one thirtieth to one sixtieth of a second and you're panning with these animals You've got to have a real delicate release of the shutter. So just make sure you're putting just a little bit of pressure on it. Let it be a surprise when the shutter actually activates. But don't mash it. That's a t-shirt. Don't mash it. Don't mash it. What are you laughing about? So many things I want to say (laughs) about your choice of words. I love it. It's great. Good tips. (laughs) Oh, that's too funny. Fire away. No, it's it's wonderful. It's, it's... sistered in really well with, with the silhouette. <laughs> something else you can experiment with uh-huh. and rotate at the hips and, and practice and play around with in that light. Uh, Mike, we'll have Mike do that video as well when he is uh, showing us how to quick change out of his underwear. Long underwear. Long, Long underwear. lazy season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here's my tip. On every shoot, and I'll do it in different ways. So if I'm shooting corporate stuff, a lot of times I'll have a DIT person that's that's taking care of all of the that's taking care of all the images as I shoot. But sometimes things are going so fast and furious, and I'm handing cards over, the DIT can be like, ah, did I download that card or did I download this? And we're, we're running through a shot list, right? So I'll have 40 shots that I have to get. And it might take us 10 minutes for one shot and an hour for another shot. It just depends on what we're doing. What I've started to do is change file names with every one of those shots. So I go back in the back of the camera, change the file name. And then it allows them to keep better structure. They know when a file name changes that we're on to the next shot, whatever it is. So it's easier for them to keep stuff organized. It's also easier to go in and check to see if that new file name is in the, it's been put on the hard drives. And then it also, you know, these cameras cycle back through at what, 10,000, 9,999, right? So if you have the same prefix before those numbers and you cycle through 10,000 shots, and then somehow when you're on your computer six months from now in the winter when you're working on images, you're like, oh, I'm just going to transfer this image over here. And you transfer it and it says, well, that image is already there. And you have some sort of meltdown and you're like, oh, no, it's not. Go ahead and replace it. And then you replace it. And then all of a sudden you lost the image that was named the same thing. I don't know. It's just a good way. With wildlife stuff, what I find myself doing is I change it every day. So I'm not doing the shots. And very seldom will you shoot over 10,000 images. I think I've done that a couple of times with like eagles or something like that, where you shoot over 10,000 shots in a day. But if you're going to shoot daily, even if I only have shot 1,500 images or whatever, I'll change it that morning. I'll just get in and change my file name. And for file structure and for just knowing, 
this is a different name and not copying over an image. I mean, there's so many reasons why it's a good idea and it's super easy. I mean, it takes well, a couple of seconds. So when you format your card, so what my workflow is, is after a shoot, I'll go back and download, get it in two places, most of the time three places, format the cards, and right after I format the cards, then I change my file name. So the next day I'm starting on the next brand new card or brand new formatted card with a new file name. And it's just worked out really well to keep my stuff straight. Yeah, it's important because I have a 10,000 cycle. Is that all four of us for a new pro tip? Yep. Okay, so now I have a question. For the video guy. Uh-oh. So as I and I know a lot of our listeners are getting more and more into video, I've got a very good organizational system for my still images and and workflow. Video workflow, however, I find that I've just got to continue to go back and, and re-watch those clips. So my question is this, how do you organize video clips based on file names, basically, I guess is what I'm looking for. Do you have a system or is that, is it just a shot by shot basis? I have it for file names, but what I do after a video shoot, so if I'm out, let's shoot in the red and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I just, hit the record button and it just didn't work out. It's out of focus. The animal didn't do what I wanted it to do. And you just know it's not a clip that you want to use, but I don't want to take the time to go through and delete all those. So I just keep them and throw them on a hard drive. What I start doing is I'll go through and watch all those clips. And as I get a good one, I just color mark it. So you know how you can tag an image like in a, in a file, I'll just turn like B roll. I'll turn green interviews. I turn blue. Um, just whatever you're shooting, just that way you can keep it separate. So when you look at a project, you can say, oh, here's all the green shots. So I'm going to put that in a B-roll folder. Here's all the blue shots. I'm going to put it in this folder. Here's all the red shots. I'm going to put it in this folder. And then you start getting it organized so that when it's time to edit, you know, if I, if I know all my interviews are on red, then I'm just going to pull that in and I'm going to create my whole audio track first with the associated video. But I don't care what it looks like. I'm just telling the story with the audio. Then I'll go to the, the green shots with the B-roll and start covering it all and not worry as much about the audio at that point, unless I have a bunch of uh, stock audio that's coming off those clips. But very seldom do you get audio and video at the same time unless you're doing an interview. If you're out just shooting wildlife, most of that stuff is dubbed in later anyway, just because it's so hard as a one-man show or one-person show to be out there gathering all that material. So... If you look at anything I'm doing, a lot of times I'm just dubbing audio from, you know, you can see an elk bugle, but I'm using that bugle from another bull that I did earlier that morning or something. So that's how I organize it. And beyond that, you know, one of the things that saves me is I have two monitors. So when I'm editing video, I have a bigger monitor that I can see all those shots too, along with the color, you know, marking or tag or whatever they call it. And then I'll know, hey, that's a green one. I don't need to pay attention to that right now. I'm just looking for interviews, which are all red. So that's that's the basics. I'm sure if you talk to someone that that's all they do is editing, they would have a much better strategy. But for me and for people like us that we are not doing, we're not editors, we're just shooters, that's a good way to get it organized and find stuff that's relatively quick. And sometimes if there's a shot that's like super awesome, like a really awesome B-roll shot, I'll make it two colors. So if I see it tagged with two colors, I'll know that's a highlight shot or something. So you can just keep doing things with color tagging that makes it work. It's a lot like a rating system in Lightroom. You just can't rate. Although in some of these programs you can rate video too, but I just have never done that. I've always just used the color. Sounds good. I just have not had a good organizational strategy yet. And I know other people are the same way. So with, with still images, I go in, I have my, you know, you've got your stars and colors in, in Lightroom. And I know, you know, one's a a keeper, but a one isn't necessarily 
one that I'm going to spend a lot of time on right away. A three is one that I'm going to work and that's going to turn out to be potentially a printable image or, or a sellable image for stock or something like that. But, um, and then, you know, a two is one that I know I need to go in and, and do some work on for sure, but it could become a three or a five. <laughs> Someday when it, it grows could up. evolve. <laughs> so uh, I do have a, a system in place for my stills, but I haven't found anything that works for video. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And there's not a good, I mean, Lightroom handles video out of some cameras, some cameras it doesn't. So you can do a little bit in Lightroom with video if you're using, I think it reads a D850 file, doesn't it? It does. It's slow, but it, it does read it. It may now. Did I just got an update on all my Adobe Suite? So I'm wondering if it updated Camera Raw, it updated all the software, the media encoder. So I'm hoping with that update, I haven't checked it yet, but I'm hoping maybe they've got that new and you know whatever they need to put in there to make those files more usable or more user friendly. Yeah, yeah. On, on the 850, it only previews it in library mode in develop mode you know you can't do anything with it obviously but right it'll be interesting to see if that evolves into that i mean it would be nice because there isn't a you know these big corporations that i work with they have some big super expensive software that will allow you to manage video but it's well beyond the price range for someone like us to go out and buy something like that just to manage video right I did notice that the latest update to the Adobe Suite added color grading to Lightroom. So I kind of wonder if that's not the direction that maybe they're heading. And I have not worked with it enough to to know how to use it well, but I did notice that that is now in the develop module in Lightroom. That'd be cool. I mean, it's got to, it's bound to get easier and easier. I mean, if you look at how far Photoshop's come and how far all of these software pieces of software have come, it's going to happen eventually, but I don't know. It's gotten way easier to edit video now. I mean, Premiere is way better than it used to be as far as handling different formats and different resolutions and working with everything. Back in the day, you, you couldn't even mix a resolution. Something else about workflow that you mentioned with your edit or the video editing is the uh, the dual monitor, and I don't know what I do without two monitors in my office going back and forth. I you can just edit and have, look at so many things by having the two connected to the one computer and just playing back and forth. I love that. Yeah, it's and it's a, a game changer. Tablet, a tablet's good too. So the mouse, the tablet, the keyboard, and the two monitors really help with workflow. Yeah, I just picked up a new monitor at, at Costco. It was an actual monitor, not a TV, and um, it's the USB 3, and it works great. I, I don't use it for color because I don't think it's color corrected, but it's great to just spread your stuff out on. So for video, it's awesome. And then I'll use a color corrected monitor, monitor when you're trying to adjust colors. So Mike, we've we've got some we've had some great questions tonight, some awesome pro tips from totally different perspectives coming at this thing with equipment with tips for winter camping not how to not get carbon monoxide poisoning and burn the camper down we did cover that as well big news this week from wild and expose you've been working i think for a couple weeks on a project that we can finally share publicly and want to get some information out about, why don't you tell us about what you've been working on on the website? So it's live, and we now have a web store. We get requests all the time, hey, can I buy a hat, or hey, can I buy a sticker, or hey, how about a t-shirt? And we've had that stuff for ourselves, but we've never really figured out how to inventory that stuff and fulfill the orders, and you can imagine if you get 10 orders, I mean, that's a lot of time to sit down there and try to figure out how to fulfill that stuff. Well, using software and some things that are, are on the internet nowadays, it's pretty simple to set up a, a fulfillment system, and we've got that going finally. So now you can go and buy T-shirts and hoodies and hats and coffee mugs and stickers, I think are the, the categories we have now. I mean, 
we'll see how that stuff goes and then we can add a few other things if we want to there's all kinds of different products that we can apply the logo to so as time goes on we'll just keep adding to it and we'll beef up the stuff that people really like or try to come up with even better stuff or i don't know it's it's cool it's fun to have it up there a great variety of ladies, men's and ladies stuff too. Unisex, different t-shirts, different different materials for what people like. Right. You know, as far as athletic t-shirts or cotton t-shirts or and toques, winter's coming. So, I mean, it's just great to have people support our podcast and, and people have asked for the past couple of years about obviously the hats because we had those and some t-shirts and hoodies. There's a lot on, on the store. And so we appreciate your support and it's super user friendly, which is ideal as well. Well, I think that's the biggest message out there, right? We do this for free and it all takes us a lot of time. So if somebody buys something, it just supports what we're doing. I mean, we're never going to get rich doing this, but if we had a little support to have somebody help us with some editing or have, you know, who knows what, put on some workshops or do whatever we want to do, this money will give us a chance to enhance what we're doing hopefully and the holidays are coming right right it's online this year every you know how many people are going shopping this is it you know one of the one of the mugs i don't have this mug yet but it starts out clear and you put your hot coffee in it and all of a sudden wild exposed appears right or moose man nature photos who we've collaborated with on this store oh yeah we should talk about that too because Moose Man has a pretty decent Facebook following and we have a pretty decent Instagram following. And then, of course, we have the podcast for if we all went out and made our own little stores, it just seemed like a lot of work. So we teamed up with those guys so that we could have Moose Man, which they do some really awesome wildlife stuff, too, and Wild and Exposed. And we're just going to put all the products on there. So if you're an avid Wild and Exposed listener and you log on and you see this Moose Man stuff, you know, that's the explanation behind that, but they do some cool stuff and they got a really cool little logo going on now. So I've seen a wild and exposed people that I know are our audience that are actually buying moose man stuff already. So that's kind of cool. And, um, we'll just see where the whole thing goes. The one thing about Christmas, if you are buying stuff for Christmas, our lead time on this stuff is not great. It's not, you know, we're still working out the kinks and I think it'll get better as we go forward, but it's generally going to take between seven and 14 days to get your stuff. So I think the cutoff date is, I think it was December 10th to get stuff. We don't have an option right now. I mean, I had no idea. And this is probably why we haven't had a store for so long. But you start looking at all the little things that you got to handle when you're trying to put up a store. So you got to deal with sales tax. You got to deal with shipping with products and then fulfillment as far as where are you going to get this product and that product. And when I was dealing with shipping, the one thing that just made it quicker to get up was just to say, we're just going to have one shipping option and it's just a ground option right now. So you can't order on, you know, December 10th and get it on December 11th or December 12th. It's just not an option yet. Hopefully we can work that in, in the future, but it just was so much to try to figure out, especially too, we are selling in Canada and North America. Well, uh, Canada and the U S so all of North America, that just seemed to be the, the easiest way to do it, but bear with us plan and plan ahead so you can get your stuff. Yeah. It's great merchandise. Great, great swag that just reminds you of adventure and, and hopefully your favorite podcast. And it's not that slow, really. I ordered two days ago and it already shipped. Really? So, yeah. Huh. I was order number six. I barely snuck in ahead of you. You did. I think like two minutes. (laughs) My mom was bummed. She wanted to be order number one, but I told her, I didn't tell her. I I was order number one, right? So I ordered her to the punch stuff and she was, she sent me a text and she was bummed that she was not number one. She might be our biggest fan. She definitely is our biggest fan. Well, it's been another fun podcast. It's always great to see you guys and catch up and to share pro tips. And I get surprised each time. We don't, we just, when it comes to the pro tips, we collect them ourselves. We get together, we get on Skype and do the podcast. And I learn something myself each time we do this. I hope you have as well. I hope you've enjoyed 
what we've shared as far as pro tips and answer some of the questions this week and just some of the fun banter going back and forth. You can find our work on wildandexposed.com where the new store is up and live with all kinds of great merchandise for you to collect and wear with pride for hopefully your favorite podcast and support our team. Thank you in advance. You can find us on YouTube. More and more of our episodes are up there for your viewing pleasure. If you have the time, watch them. Give us the, the thumbs up, the five-star rating. Hit that bell so that when they do go up, it's just usually every Friday. Uh, the audio podcasts go live on Tuesdays and the videos on YouTube on Friday. For your viewing enjoyment, you get to see what we're talking about in person and the laughs and the great backgrounds all the guys have going on here and with the guests and so forth as well. You can also find us on Facebook. Anyway, guys, it's been a blast. As always, great to see you. Thank you to the listening audience. Until next time, you've been listening to Wild and Exposed Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed Podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday Nothing's gonna get in our way We will be the biggest band in time